Good evening, everyone. My name is Wee Wang, and uh, it is a great pleasure for me to um, share some of my works with you tonight. Uh, the talk I make today is about time-bound multipass channel parameter estimation and tracking. So uh, there will be two, two parts in my talk. So the first part will be uh, the wireless propagation channel and uh, the time variant parameter estimation. And in the part two, I will show you some applications of time variant channel parameter tracking, particularly some research topics in recent years. <clears throat> so in the beginning, I'm, I'm going to show you some example, some background or modifications. Uh, so in this page, I would like to show, I would share a little bit about communications and positioning, you know, because I, I thought, I thought some of you are not familiar with, with this. So that's why I, I would like to, to share some basic backgrounds. And as you can see on the left, on the left photo, so the wireless communication has been paid uh, significant attentions for many decades. It has been the most important application of uh, what is called wireless radio systems. To it. And uh, as you can see in the photo, it is a very funny, funny picture. Uh, people call it the walking zombie because we we like to uh, read articles, watch movies while we're walking on the smartphone. This is a very <clears throat> typical case nowadays. And of course, we have another ma major application of wireless systems, that is the positioning. Mm. So the positioning system has attracted also a lot of attentions in the past years. For instance, we're, while we're driving the car, we need a, we need a navigator to, to, to guide us to, the, to our destination. So this is also very important. So both systems, both wireless communications and positioning become important in our daily life nowadays. And uh, they both push forward uh, the technology development. But uh, at the moment, there's, there's a demand of joint data transmission position. And this demand becomes uh, steadily, how does it called? Because we need to exchange a large number of data like, for instance, like autonomous driving, we need to exchange a large number of data, including maps, right? In, in environment information, including the other cars, where the other cars are, and also the traffic situation. In the meantime, we also need to precisely look, position ourselves, or we, we want to precisely position our car. <clears throat> and this is also very important for autonomous driving because it's, so relevant to the safety issue. Okay, so far, we know that these two systems, communication and positioning, are developed independently. So what does it mean? It means uh, people like Huawei, they developed a communication system like 5G or 6G. <clears throat> More or less, they design system regardless of positioning. And the same thing for positioning. Like if we if if we want to design a positioning system for GPS or for Beidou, normally we don't care about the communication. So, so that is the situation at the moment. And this this part, and I will I will talk a little bit later about this part about joint communication, joint uh, positioning. Okay. Uh, Next, let's have a look on the key difference between COM and positioning. So uh, in short, the goal of both systems are different. So how to say, for communications, we need to reconstruct or recover the transmitted information because that, that is the most important thing we, 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 we want to do in this kind of system, right? For instance, if you see here, we have transmitter or we have base station and we have mobile station somewhere. And transmitter is transmitting uh, a sequence or a bit, uh, a, a sequence of, of information like plus one, minus one, minus one. After or passing through the wireless channel, 
and we the received signal is somehow distorted. And this is what we want to do in the communication system because we want we want to recover what we are transmitting. And this is the core uh, core part of this system. And all the algorithms like equalization and so channel estimation and so on are designed to overcome the, the, the problems occurs during the transmission. And as for positioning, the key, the key point is to estimate the distance between the transmitter and the receiver that is used for position later because we want, we want to solve the coordinates and uh, this is what we, we normally do. We take the distance between transmitter and receiver and solve this the so-called uh, navigation equations. And uh, now, as you can see in the figure below, and this is more clear that we're not interested in transmitting the data, but we want to extract the distance between the transmitter and the receiver based on receive the signal. So that's just, that's totally different from from the from the communications. Okay. Okay. Next, I'm, I'm I I would like to show a very simple example about the channel. So what what a propagation channel looks like. Okay. I think about we have a transmitter somewhere on the left hand side. So the base station is going to transmit uh, the same the same sequence. Okay. And uh, a mobile user is somewhere not so far away. And uh, in the environment, we have a house, for instance, a house and uh, a trees. And we assume that the signal transmitted by the base station can be received by the mobile user via three different routes, as you can see. So, Here's the here's the story. So the same the same message is transmitted by the transmitter, but they are transmit they are passing through different routes with different lengths, right, and different distortion. So for instance, we have a signal is reflected by the house facade, and uh, we have also scattered by the tree surface. And this is what we we can see at the receiver side. So we have, uh, for instance, if you can, if you see the first arrived signal is in the blue curve, and this is the direct pass, corresponding to the direct pass, the, the signal is transmitted directly from the transmitter to the receiver, and the second pass is corresponding to the reflected pass by, by the house facade in red. And as for the trees, because trees are huge, are large, right, and the surface is irregular, so we have a lot of a bunch of uh, scattered paths. They arrived at, at, at the receiver at different time. So if if we have uh, a system that, that that is with a sufficient large bandwidth, then we can uh, separate all these signals because we can we 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 we, we can we can see the, we can see the three copies of the signals in delay domain. And this is also called the multipass effect. Okay, so as for the communication, uh, the multipass effect causes uh, intersuper interference, as, there, uh, as we know. And this photo is a very famous example from the Wikipedia. You can download. So this is called ghost uh, ghost effect because uh, the image transmitted by the transmitter is is propagated via different routes, and they all superposed and infer to each other. And this is what we see eventually if we don't do anything against this effect. And uh, of course, we know that we can do equalization, right? We estimate channel and we do the equalization to, to, to compensate this uh, multipass effect. As for the positioning, uh, this would be the similar effect that the, the, the performance of the positioning will be degraded due to the, due to the, due to the wrong estimated uh, distance between transmitter and receiver. So he, here's the snapshot or static case. What about time variant case? So now let's see that the mobile user is moving forward. So the three passes are now a little bit look a little bit a little bit different, right? 
according to geometry, so we see the, the time of the flight or the time of the arrival of individual copies are changing. So for instance, for the first part or the direct path, the delay is decreased right, because we are getting closer to the transmitter and so on for the reflection by the house facade and for the scatter paths. And we should keep in mind this the power and the phase of all these passes are also changed due to the uh, different geolocations. Okay, now we see there's a kind of correlation, right? In uh, space or over space in both time domain and also in, uh, in angular domain. So this is what we want to talk later. Is that how can we how can we utilize this kind of uh, spatial correlation to enhance the channel estimation and tracking? So I think you guys are familiar with communication, but so I I'm not going to talk uh, too many details about that. But I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about pro, uh, about this positioning especially influenced by the multipass propagation. So the position accuracy is very much depending on the performance of the range estimation. So as we said, as, uh, as we talked before, in positioning, we want to track, uh, extract the range or the distance between transmitter and receiver. And how do we do that? If you, if you may see the plot on the, on the, on the upper page, and this is the very standard one so far, how we how people do the ranging, how we estimate the distance between transmitter and receiver. So on transmitter, we are transmitting a, a kind of sequence. It could be, uh, the, the assumption is we know what we're transmitting. We don't, because we don't need, we, we, we're not, we not care about uh, the data, but we're caring about the distance estimation. So we transmitting, a lone signal could be the pilots, for instance. And this sequence is transmitting through the air, right? And then arrived by the mobile user. In a mobile user, what do we do? We do the correlation. So by the so-called correlator. In the correlator, we use a copy of what we are transmitting to do the correlate course correlation to what we with what we received in the, in the, in our front end. So even in the, in the end, we will figure out uh, the correlation out or correlation output, and the maximum peak of this output is corresponding to the time, and this timing is exactly what when the signal is arriving at, re, at the receiver, and this is what we do nowadays. <clears throat> so uh, we do have a very simple simulation simulation example here. Like for instance, we have one tap channel, so only one pass. The output of the correlator is displayed by the green curve. As you can see, the maximum peak is exactly the same as the true pass. If we have multi-pass, like we have second pass and third pass by red and black curves respectively, re respectively then the output of the correlator is changed a little bit. So particularly the maximum peak is drifted and we call it the multipass error in the ranging. Okay, so this is the first issue. And the second issue is we, we need to extract, how to call it, this distance between transmitter and receiver, right? But you, we all know that in communications, the first pass is not usually the line of sight. It could be the long line of sight and we want transmitted data in communication, so we normally we don't care what we uh, when we receive the signal. We only need to care the signal is arrived. Then I start to uh, re retrieve the data. For instance, we want we want to transmit an image from the moon back to Earth. We don't need we are not interested in the real time scenes. We we are, we, are, we more care about the quality of the image, right? More, more or less the data data coverage. So here's the issue with the positioning because we are interested in distance between transmitter and receiver. So in this case, the, the line of sight, or in other words, the geometric line of sight is more interesting for us because that is more relevant to the distance, <clears throat> right? So for line of sight case, we have additional bias, as you can see by the second 
uh, yellow curve. This is none of side bias. It's additional bias caused by the publication itself. All right, this is, a, <clears throat> this is a static case. And now we, if we look at time variant case, and this figure shows an example of the estimated result of the channel parameters based on the real measurement data. <clears throat> and this, this passes, as you can see, the, these passes are tracked by the comma filter. And we obviously, we see some uh, passes that are, is lasting very long time, right? As you can see in the top one. Also, we see a lot of passes that is uh, disappearing or appearing very rapidly. So this is a very common case that occurs in our daily, in, 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 in a real environment. So as a conclusion for this part, for this page, the range tracking algorithm may benefit from this spatial temporal correlation of the channel. So this is what we are going to talk next. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this page, I guess. So I would, I would like to briefly introduce you the requirements for the multipass channel model. So what does the communication positioning need in channel model? So first, for communication, the typic, we, the, uh, a very typic uh, white, uh, white stationary, uh, white sense stationary anchorage scatter assumption is valid and is also sufficient. So this is why for like for GSM simulation or for the third generation communication system simulation, we all, we only need the WSS US assumption. And this brings us a lot of convenience and uh, because the channel model is very simple. But for positioning, we don't uh, we, we don't need this because the WSS US is not valid anymore. Because uh, if if we are if we are moving, the mobile user is moving, the channel is changing, it's rapidly varying. So the channel is not stationary anymore. So we need a long WSSUS based channel model. So according to this, we see that for a tapped inline channel model is sufficient for communication, right? And uh, for positioning, we need a long discrete, a high resolution model. A long discrete is particularly referring to the delay domain. So in delay, we, we need a high resolution a model. So for the tra traditional block fitting model is, is very popular for communication, but for positioning, we need a continuously varying channel model. This is what we call time varying channel model. So uh, of course we, we can add on some short-term fading on top of this uh, black uh, block fading for communication. Like we add fading, uh, small scale fading, we add a Doppler effect that is enough for communication, but for positioning, we need something more. We need uh, not only fading and Doppler, but also the changes of the delay as well as the anchor. So what we can see is that the channel model we need for communication is much simpler compared to the channel model for positioning. And this also introduces a lot of uh, complexity and uh, a lot of works for us to to derive a channel model for positioning. Okay. So now let's have a look a little bit on mathematics. So for tapped inline model, so we see the each beam in delay can be regarded as a relevant channel tap. And this tap, each tap here is parameterized by varying complex amplitude as well as the Doppler. So the fading is, is included in this varying complex amplitude. And of course, we specify in, pre, in, in the beginning a certain number of taps here denoted by n, right? As you can see. But for oops, for the for the continuous model, as we saw before, for the positioning, we have uh, individual passes that is parameterized by varying complex amplitude, also the delay and angular. For instance, angle of arrival and angle of, Doppler, uh, angle of departure and Doppler and so on. So we see that in the model, in the mathematical, in the mathematical model, the, they, are they are looking a little bit different. And uh, of course, we see the continuous model is more complex because the number of rays is also varying according to time, <clears throat> as well as the delay. So, okay, 
So let's consider a slapshot case. Okay, so we are receiving a signal and uh, yt denotes y tau, and this y tau can be given by s tau convoluted with the channel h tau plus the awgn, right? And especially in my in my case, we can write down in the matrix form, which is linear. And as for as for continuous model, it's more complex. So the re received signal is is a superposition of uh, of L passes, as you can see here. Each pass is is, is uh, characterized by its complex amplitude and uh, antenna pattern here, and as well as the the phase phase rotation due to the delay, right? And what we can see is we can easily describe this by uh, for extent to MIMO, and we can also incorporate the front end effect of uh, of this. RF devices into the model. Also, we have to keep in mind the noise here is so far as white Gaussian is very important because because if we uh, if we do some um, manipulations, for instance, especially for the capital X, capital X is uh, is the frequency dependent term because if you are if you are considering a white band cha uh, channel. So we have we may have additionally distortions according to the frequency. If we consider this part in the model and we separate it out of this uh, first term, then we see that the noise now is becomes becoming a color noise, not white Gaussian more anymore. And it was as we know that if it's color noise, we have a lot of troubles in in the theoretic deviation, like like maximum likelihood estimator and so on. So this is a very uh, complicated cases. So to solve this slapshot based parameter estimation, we can summarize something here. Like if we know, if we don't know anything about the PDF of the, of the noise, but the model can be linearly represented. So we can use a simply RS estimator, right? Like for communication this is the most common as the channel estimation method. But if we know this likelihood of this uh, noise of the model, but we don't know any primary information, so we can apply the so-called maximum likelihood estimator, right? And in channel estimation, in channel channel modeling, we especially have this so-called Sage method that is used very commonly to solve this super resolution channel estimate channel estimation. And one step further, if we know the likelihood. I we know the prior information, so we can apply the Bayesian estimator, right? Like MMSE or MAP, and so on. <clears throat> and of course, we have some other method, like uh, subspace-based uh, approach, like use music or Esprit. So this page is basically a summary of what we normally do for for channel estimation. And uh, okay, I think I simply skip this part. Too many mathematics. So, uh, just some example of using the Sage, the maximum likelihood estimator, to extract the channel pass parameters out of the measurement data. So, on the left side, you see a measurement data from uh, uh, from the rear, for using the rear devices, and uh, one axis is corresponding to the receiver travel distance, it is indicating that uh, the measurement is time is designed for time varying situation and another axis is called delay times speed of night so we transfer we convert the delay from time domain to the distance domain and if we make a slice of this 3d version we have a 2d version right <clears throat> so the x axis is corresponding to the delay and the y coordinates is the amplitude so because because we because we use rear devices, so every rear device every device is, is subject to a limited bandwidth. So according to the bandwidth, we can we can determine this uh, delay resolution as you can see by the cross dots, but in, in the figure, and we want to extract the individual path param parameters using the Sage. And the, now you can see some red stems or right nice indicating the extracted extracted uh, uh, parameters, and uh, these are the result out of the sage.
And according to the estimation, we can reconstruct the band limited, the band limited version of the measured channel impulse response by the green curve. And what we can see is that for the high power parts, we are more or less uh, very good performed, right? For the lower part, because these are mostly in the noise samples, so that's why we don't consider this part. Now, if we go one step further, if we look all this measured channel impulse response and apply the SAGE algorithm to every measured samples, then we obtain this kind of a plot, like a cloud, as you can see. So we have some problems here. So the first would be we need additional model orders detection to it. In other words, we need to first figure out how many passes for different times. And the second problem is we sometimes, from time to time, we misestimate some parameters, right? Because due to the wrong number of passes we detected. And uh, the third, which is also the most important one, is that we need a, a very complex algorithm to associate different passes because the SAGE is a selection based algorithm. So from, from the previous time to next time, we are not, we have no idea. I estimate 10 passes before and I also estimate 10 passes later, but how can we associate these 10 passes? So which pass belongs to which one, one, one second before? So that's just the most difficult part. And uh, Normally we have the so-called uh, sequential Bayesian filtering to overcome these this problems. And I guess due to the time limitation, I'm not going to detailed a uh, version of this part, but I'm going to introduce a summary of this because for Bayesian approach, we have a three very famous uh, implementations like comma filter or EKF or particle filter. So for to, to solve our problems here, to solve our to or to track our time variant parameters, we summarize the pros and cons of all three implementations. Like for comma field, it's very simple, right? Low complex, low complex, but it can only cope with the linear model because as you can, as you can see in the equation, we have a highly long linear model. So the KF is normally not a good candidate for this. And of course, for EKF, it is it is designed for long linear model, but only cope with a small perturbations or to linearity. So it means if we have very closely spaced uh, passes, we may have troubles where we are separating these passes by EKF. So as a third one, the particle filter. So the particle filter can cope with long linearity, easy to deploy, but the complexity is also very high. So in the next, I'm just briefly introduce you a very simple algorithm that is based on the Sage algorithm. As you see, the Sage algorithm is a maximum likelihood based, but it is a select, it is a select based. And we extend the Sage with the so-called common filter to combine both one. And uh, by this uh, combined version, we call it CAST. By using this CAST, we can overcome the problems I just mentioned before. For instance, we need model order detection, we need pass associ association and so on. So all these issues are solved by this new proposed CAST algorithm. And let me just skip this uh, result and just show you some Comparison result based on measurement. So if you still remember the, the upper per, the upper plot is the is the measurement result I just showed before. So the upper one is the estimation result based on sage only. So a pure pure selection based algorithm. The lower one would be the cast algorithm, that is a tracking algorithm. And now what we can comparing from the figures is we solve this miss misestimation problem, right? The first one. And the second one is the pass association. That is a very important because for tracking, especially for like before for the radar application or for any tracking algorithms, we need somehow to identify the, which one belongs to which. So this is a very, very uh, 
tricky issues. All right, this is a sum. This is for part one. So in part one, we talked a little bit about the multipass propagation, right? How multipass propagation affects communication and positioning. And we particularly introduced how we can track the channel using this very simple algorithm, like combining the Sage algorithm and the, the common filter. In the part two, and part two, I'm going to uh, introduce a little bit about applications of these tracking algorithms. So how can we benefit from this tracking algorithm? So the first application would be joint communication and uh, positioning. And uh, so far, we know that uh, for positioning, the transmitted signal is perfectly alone. So we know what we are transmitting. But for communications, we don't. We are we are spending, uh, let's say, ninety percent more than ninety percent resource in transmitting unknown data. So the loan data is also known as the pilot that is sparsely allocated. So how can we do this? joint communication and positioning in the same system in an efficient way. So I briefly went through this history of this joint com and pause. So in the very, in the very beginning, we just simply combined both systems. We combined the output from GPS and from the communication system. And that is very rude, but uh, very simple. No cost, but a very low efficient. So uh, later, people think about by extended current systems of communication, like in third generation for UMTS, people think about to extend the communication system to positioning. So uh, some functionality for positioning is integrated in the system, but it's still lack of, it is still lack of high accuracy. And nowadays, we are thinking about using a unified signal structure for joint common pulse. And this is more efficient and more accurate. And of course, also, also it save our cost in the device. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to uh, very briefly introduce a method of this joint com and uh, pause. But first, I, 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 I will talk about the common keys for com and pause. Because for communication, we, are trans we want to transmit as much data as possible, right? But for positioning, we don't need to to transmit uh, the data, unknown data. So it means the pilot in communication system is used for, but very sparsely for channel estimation. And for positioning, we need a large number of pilots to accurately estimate channel, as channel parameters. So uh, as a conclusion for this uh, study, that the common key for both part would be a curate channel estimation, right? Now let's have a look on figure below. This is a very typical uh, resource allocation for OFDM system, right? The, uh, let me see, yes. The white part indicates the unknown data and the gray part indicates the pilot that is loaned to the receiver. And uh, now we see, we know that for for some some years ago, people introduced a, a so-called uh, iterative method to to estimate channel and data in a, in a, in, a, in iterative way. So, for instance, we use the pilot to extract the channel as the channel information first, and use the channel information to detect our data, and then. Come back to come back again to use the detected data to re-estimate channel and so on. So this is called iterative structure. And uh, now, because we have a conflict between COM and pause, because in COM we want to use less pilots, but for positioning we want to use more pilots. And here comes the question: that is, can we satisfy both without using regular pilots, even without any pilots? And the an answer is yes. It's very simple. So. The idea is simply rely on the iterative structure. So we are tracking the channel and use the channel prediction for the next time step to first estimate or first detect the data and use the data back again to re-estimate the channel and so on. So I'm going to skip the very detailed steps. 
I'm just going to show you some examples of the based on the real measurement data. So we did some field test in, in outdoor. And uh, this is the result of the range tracking. So the dashed blue line corresponding to the true range, which is obtained by the tachometer, which is very accurate. And then the red one is corresponding to the tracked range by the algorithm we just mentioned. And for, for the line of sight part, we see this is a very, very good result because uh, I think the, 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 the arrow of the ranging would be just few centimeters. So it means this kind of method is, is, uh, is valid in some uh, environment. And also for, for the amplitude of the first tracked parse, we also compare with some theoretic uh, method like the left edge model. And it fits also very much to what we want to obtain in, in, the, in the end. Okay. And also for, for the communication part, we also plot the bit error rate here. And uh, in the line of sight part, we see the bit error rate is, is not so high. It's below uh, 10 to the power of minus two. But as long as the receiver is moving to the line, to the line of sight rate, um, part, so the power is dropping down, as you can see in, in the upper one. So the bit error rate is increased a little bit. Okay. So, uh, I guess I guess I guess I don't have too much time left, but I will I will still go through the last the last one because the last one is most I think is, I personally likes very much because it's very interesting. Uh, it's about positioning. So so far we need three base stations or at least three base stations or four satellites more more than four satellites to do the positioning, and here comes the question. Uh, can we still do the positioning in a rich multipath environment in the case of that we don't have sufficient number of visible transmitter? So think about in the future, we don't, we don't have four satellites, we have only one satellite. Uh, can, we, can we still do the position? So the answer is yes. The idea is behind the idea behind is from what we just mentioned before. We track the channel, right? We use the multipass. Because multipass in a very old term is regarded as a bad thing. As we see, it caused ghosting effect for communication. It increased the range errors before. But now we are thinking something opposite. So multipass can improve the communication performance by diversity, is what we already known 20 years ago. And now we want to also use the multipass to assist the positioning. And this is called a very hot topic nowadays. It's called multipass assisted positioning. So we have, think about we have a case here. We have a base station, only one base station inside a room. And we have a mobile user want to enter in the room and going outside from the right hand side. So let's go inside the room first. So we have a line of sight, right? We have a reflectors on the wall, and we have a scatter on the corner of the edge, uh, the wall edge. So we consider all these three passes. So it means we are receiving three copies of what we are transmitting. And now we want to move forward, and uh, all three passes exist. And then after this corner, the line of sight is gone. We have only two passes left, and so on. So let's have a look at what happened in this in, in this road. So first we see the reflection passes. Because we know the microwave reflection follows the rule of uh, Schnell's, rule, uh, Schnell's law, law, which is exactly the same for the light. So the incoming, the instant angle is, is exactly the same as the outbouncing angle, right? So eventually we can find a mirror point of this must of all these reflected paths. So to the receiver, it looks like another virtual transmitter is transmitting signal no matter where I am, right? We call this a virtual transmitter. The good thing is the virtual transmitter is static in position and uh, it is naturally synchronized in clock to the real transmitter. <clears throat> okay, this is for this part. And we can do the same thing for the scatterers, right? This point, the scatter point, 
can be regarded as a virtual transmitter as well. And the same as the first one, it, uh, the position of the virtual transmitter here <clears throat> is also static and is also synchronized to the real transmitter, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> now what we can do is now we have only one physical transmitter, but we have two virtual transmitters. So now we have three. We have three transmitter means we have three equations. It means we can solve the two, uh, two unknown parameters of X and Y. So we estimate the RX positioning in motion with recursive Bayesian estimation, like using common filter or particle filter. But first we need to extract the path. This is the first step because we need to know we, we, we need to know the path parameter in the beginning. So this is this is what we can benefit from the path tracking. We can use the track the path parameters for for as an input for this uh, multipath assisted positioning. Okay, uh, this is not so important. Good, uh, there's also one issue that is very crucial for this multipath assisted positioning, that, uh, that is the reflection surface is curvature. Before we show a flat, a flat wall, a flat surface, but now what if the surface is, is curvature, as you can see in the figure, it means we cannot find a mirror point in static. Instead, while the receiver is moving, this virtual transmitter is also moving. If the virtual transmitter is moving and we have to estimate the same number of unknown parameters in time, so that is a big issue. Okay, I think uh, in this part, I introduce you some interesting applications of of path tracking, the one is semi-blind channel, uh, semi-blind channel tracking that is can applied for joint communication positioning, and the second would be the multipath assisted positioning that he, you use the multipath, turn the multipath from the bad side to the to uh, to the good side. <clears throat> okay, uh, that is all for my talk, and uh, I wish you all a happy New Year, happy Chinese New Year, and thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Wang. Uh, it is a wonderful talk on communications and positioning. All right. Any more questions? Thank you from so much, sir, for students? the knowledge. Sir, I have a question. Yes, please. From Professor Wang, may I ask? <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, sir, as uh, uh, part one of your presentation, uh, we, we see two models, tab uh, play model and continuous model. Uh, my question is, uh, in which circumstances we will apply a continuous model? Okay, uh, as I said, it, it is depending on the application. Like for communication, we just simply apply tabular line model as sufficient, but for positioning application, especially for tracking, if we want to do tracking, we want to track a target, we need to simulate the time variant channel. And in, in this case, we need to apply this continuous model. That is more accurate, but also more complex. Yes, thank you. Okay, any more questions? I also have one question. Yes, go ahead. For the multipath assisted uh, position with transmitter visibility information, is it regarded as a line line of sight or non-line of sight from first world transmitters? Okay, for multipath assisted positioning, actually is is regardless of line of sight or none of sight. The core part is using the multipaths. So even without presence of the land of sight, we can still do the positioning using the multipaths. That is because as long as we can find a static virtual transmitter and then we can do the positioning, even, even the land of sight is not present. No. Okay, thank you so much. I got it. Okay, any more? Um, I have a question. 
please. Uh, hello, Professor Wang. Uh, I know that Sage requires multiple iter it um, 就是嗯 multiple iterations to ensure the accuracy of the estimate estimation. So how to balance the balance it with the com computational complexity? Okay, uh, th that is a very good question, actually. Uh, we know Sage is a maximum likelihood, but uh, precisely it's a quasi-maximum likelihood because it's high dimensional and we use, just as you mentioned, an iterative approach for these optimization steps. And uh, I mean, we know optimization is very complex. And first, if we have a very good initialization, we call it starting values, then that will be very good for later the optimization steps. And, um, but on the other side, if we, if we don't have this, uh, these good initials, I would say based on my experience, we most likely end up with a very long, long time in uh, iterations because uh, we couldn't converge to the global maximum. And uh, this is a very, very challenging because uh, maybe you you have you are trying with Sage and you Sage you have so we have so many para parameters to to tune like uh, uh, for instance the convergence level and also some some like like the optimization how fine we are searching is in, in delay domain or in angular domain so that 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 is very tricky actually but what I can see as a as a summary is um, first we need to make sure these initials are very good uh, good enough. And the second is we can uh, we can somehow uh, choose the correct models. By models, I mean uh, the DMC because Sage is Sage is rely on the so-called specular path model, but in reality, we most mostly we have this diffuse multipath components. And for diffuse diffuse multipath components, we are not incorporating this in the Sage. We need to modify this this model, or somehow we have somehow incorporate this part in the model, for instance, using some filter first to filter out this part to make sure the Sage assumption is valid. And this, this also guarantee a very fast convergence. <clears throat> and uh, the last would be would be the number of, uh, how to call it, uh, uh, not number, the, the, the optimi optimization method. Like we have uh, Levenberg Markvet for searching this op the global maximum, or we can use DFP. We have some. We have a lot of a good optimization method to find the global maximum. That is all. Uh, I would recommend to to try because a different environment for sure have different uh, the channel status or what I say the correlations, the, how close they are, and so on. So that is very tricky. You have to try individually for, for different environments. So that, that's what I can tell you, yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, that's true. We still have uh, uh, one minute for the last question. So, any more? Uh, uh, hello, teacher. I have one question. Um, as the teacher said, channel parameter estimation and tracking of positioning is very important. But in multi-path environment, channel estimation is complex. In terms of improving the performance of communication, the effectiveness of channel parameter tracking based on Bayesian filter. That's all. Okay. Okay, so uh, sorry, uh, I, I I think I mean, I miss your question, your your, your last sentence. Uh, so I I want to know the uh basing filter is effective uh on channel parameter tracking in multi pace in multi pace environment. Uh channel 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 uh, channel uh, the varying of the channel, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is also very uh, a good question. Actually, actually, it's a key part, a key issue for tracking, because so far what I'm what I what I talked tonight is uh, all re regarding to uh, as, as uh, how to call it this is uh, low varying case or um, the mobile user is moving with a low speed, with very 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 small speed, 
because we know that if the channel is varying too fast, but my measurement rate is not so far so high, it all could be the case that the channel between two these uh, how to call it adjacent slab shot are very far away in space separated. So in this case, the channel is for sure uncorrelated because it's beyond one one wavelength, right? So in, in this case, we can still do something like <clears throat> because before we are tracking the amplitude, complex amplitude, and delay, but now we cannot track the phase anymore because the phase is changing fast. But we can still track the delay and angle, right? So we can first we can do something like we can use the large scale parameters like delay and the angular, use that as input to the next time step, and we retrieve this amp complex amplitude in the initial steps. And that's something we can do, but it is still working. But uh, as I said, this is not so, so nice because <clears throat> we are using only partially the information from last time step. So the good thing is we insert a new pilots. So using the new pilots, we can solve perfectly. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thanks. Uh, due to the time limitation, we will stop here. If you guys have mm -hmm. any further questions, you can contact Professor Wang uh, offline, discuss uh, directly to this Professor Wang. Uh, the contact information of Professor Wang is available online, right? Uh,